Good day to you. Happy Christmas season. We're right in between Christmas and New Year, and this is the 27th day of December, 2023, from Chico, California, where it just started to rain copiously. My local creek is already filled from the first rain of the year. We don't get as much rain as we used to. We don't get any snow in the coast range anymore, where I used to see snow every year because the earth is burning up. So that's our news report. We could mention some other things like Ukraine and Russia. Ooh, let's not go there. Israel and Palestine, the Gaza Strip. Ooh, let's not go there. Israel's declaring war on Iran. Well, that's the way it goes. We're in the science room now, and we are currently pursuing the secrets of the universe. And this is time. It has nothing to do with it, what goes on in the world. The world will do what it does, and there's nothing, not even God, can do anything about what the world is going to do to itself. Always has. Nobody likes it. But there's rational logic. Thank God. This is the Christmas season, so I'm allowed to give a little prayer. It's not to induce you to enlist to some cause or give me money. But it is raining here, and so I'm in a very jolly mood. Plus, my niece dropped by with some ham egg casserole, which is a recipe that's been handed down from generation to generation in my family. It's worshipped. I don't worship anything that looks like cheese, but my stomach worships it. My stomach has a mind of its own, and it's like... I have to acknowledge my stomach or you get cancer. <laughs> so I just found the cure for cancer. Don't worry about it. Well, plus follow the rules. Problem is finding the rules. Now the rule we're trying to find is for the universe. The theory of everything, well, we covered that somewhat. Of course I could only touch upon it in the last lecture. Because theory of everything, well by definition, it would take multiple infinities of time even to prepare the lecture. So you have a long wait for the theory of everything if it means what it sounds like it means, which would pretty much be the definition of insanity. You could ask Georg Contor. No, you can't ask Georg Contor unless you want to go where Georg Contor went and nobody knows. But he was insane when he died, whether from lead poisoning or just chewing on pennies too much or playing with mercury with his fingers like we were allowed to do. We were encouraged. You know, a scientific inquest. It's just don't touch it with your tongue or you'll get your brain will freeze. Because it's a heavy metal. If it gets in your blood, you're dead. Lead? Copper? Nah! Mercury's the worst. We used to play with it. Dice it up with our fingers and find it's crawled in but into your fingerprint, well, I have mercury in my brain. That could explain a lot. But it won't explain the theory of everything unless you use rational logic. And so whatever the chemicals that I've consumed in my lifetime on this poor, destitute planet floating in the universe, God knows where, don't worry. If there is a God, the definition would be the guy who knows where we actually are. That would be a definition of God in science somehow. On the philosophical side, we don't go there. Where we're going is G equals E. It had been G equals Q. But in our last lecture, we discovered the quantum is merely the formulation of the incommensurability of impenetrability and continuity based on the relationship between the only example of impenetrability in the universe, which is the proton, and the only example of continuity in the universe, which is the electron... And when it sheds something out, <laughs> which we call light. <laughs> so we're getting to light. We, this where I'm trying to get to is a geometric formulation of the flight of the photon. Well, is there such thing as a photon? Let's begin there. But we're, what we're after, and we're going to get to the end of in this lecture, is the theory of everything. We got a good head start in the last lecture. And if you didn't see the last lecture, that's... Probably going to be okay, but I'll bear in mind that some people 
probably 99%, if there are any listeners, and I pray someday there will be, <laughs> although I have a few, I cherish my listeners. I'll respond to all your comments. You don't offend me. You say whatever you want about me, and I'll answer kindly. That's my vow. I'm not a combatant. I'm not out to prove anything except the truth. So if you have anything to say about the truth, those are the comments I welcome most. Like, you're full of shit on this point, and you just, like, spell it out. Fucking I love you. Thank you. Nobody's really done that yet, although I've gotten about a half a dozen very, very good leads from my commentators. So I swear I appreciate every one of your comments, but it, you see, it's kind of confusing because I don't subscribe to this, this theology that I'm supposed to be making Bitcoin. Like, like, I need your likes. Be sure you press like. I never, well, I, I, I suggest you do because I, I, I like likes. It's free. I mean, you're not losing anything. It's like, oh, put that down in the red ledger. You used up one of your likes. Well, you only have nine trillion left. No, press like if you want to, but don't press it if you don't feel, I never, well, lately I start pressing like on certain things having to do with world events. And things that have to do with very good science, I'll sometimes give a like. But I really think that I have like two dozen likes that I'm allowed to use it, and I've used up about half of them in the past month. <laughs> and before that, I never press like because why get involved, man? <laughs> you know? But subscribe? <laughs> never. Lately? Yes. I've subscribed to some pretty good stuff lately, and I'm very grateful that I have. And that is that the universe somehow in Cyberland taught me in my dumbness, you too could be getting good stuff, but you have to look. It's 99 of 100, it's no way. You're down to 1%, so that's going to be work. That takes time. I have lots of time. So I found some good stuff. But I'm going to try to give you some good stuff today. I assume that's why you're listening, and so let's get into it. We want the theory of everything, but we really don't want to call it that, and so we give it a more accurate scientific designator, which means the theory of everything, but it's an equation. Pretty simple, only three symbols. So it's G, which is gravity. G... <laughs> hold on, hold on, I'll get it. G... I can't watch and do it... As G, oh my God, I almost did it right. Let me try one more time. No, I don't want to waste your time. Yes, I do. G equals E. Now, the formulation that is currently at the very top, the ultra top, the deluxe suites of the sky room of super brainy physics that's doing the real thing with all of their might, their heroes. That's how I picture it in my mind. I don't know how you grew up with comics or not. The real, real edge. We're, we're getting out there, in there. Well, what's that? Quantum gravity. One could embark on a lampoon of another, yet another ridiculous name in science. But it, it's better to take the high road. Avoid the sarcasm, avoid the satire. I've been guilty of this in the past. It's hard to resist when you're a pedant who knows the lexical rules and it's your actual job to enforce them. So I think I could be forgiven, but I don't forgive myself. So I'm holding myself to account on this. So let's get moving. No more dilly-dally-pally. Just made that up. Isn't that nice? Well, it's raining. I feel good. All right. So the theory of everything is actually G equals... Oh, yeah, I did do it wrong last time. E. I think I got it right that time. Now, that was G equals Q, which is quantum gravity. Q for quantum and G for gravity. We covered that fairly well in the last lecture, but let me summarize that so we know where we're beginning today. If you're tuning in for the first time, which is your right. You don't have to do any homework. I, I don't never assign any. 
You better, you better, oh, you're tuning in for the first time? Well, you're delinquent. You arrived late. Now you have homework. Oh, not here, Daddy. No, it's the job of a scientist to make your life easy. It's not the job of the scientist to make you regret that you walked in at all. Which is a fine line. It's like walking a tightrope between the Twin Towers, which is actually done. Obviously would have had to be before, I think, 2001, right? Yeah. But some Frenchman did it. I don't know how you arrange to string a cable between the two towers. Well, this Frenchman set it up and then he just goes dancing across. Well, pretty careful dancing because if he falls, it's the highest fall from a building that you could take. <laughs> but that's not really the theory of everything, is it? Let's make sure we walk this tightrope, though. It's very difficult to stay on track if you're jolly. The rain is cut because I know that I'm going to be re relieved of asthma for, for this rainfall. And I won't tell you about my... <laughs> I mean, there's people dying in the Gaza Strip right now. I have a sore throat or I'm coughing or dying or whatever. Who cares? There's people risking their lives to save other innocent people and buildings that the Israeli Defense Force is targeted because there's civilians in there. How much crying can we cause with one shot? 2,000 pound bombs to blow up anywhere where Palestinians are alive, especially if they're children. But that's not really the theory of everything or science. It is kind of part of everything, though. So if you're going to have a theory of everything, you'd want to take into consideration that the Israeli government just declared war on the oldest nation on Earth. Yesterday. It's begun. And now, and now Israel is telling the United States to do two things. Deploy nuclear, at least nuclear threat, but I think it'll go nuclear and so does another high-level commentator. The United States Pentagon, which is directed from Jerusalem, essentially, I think you understand these are just symbolic names having nothing to do with the world itself, just two arbitrary places called, for instance, New York or Washington, D.C. or the Pentagon, whatever that is. But however you tell American aircraft carriers where to go or how much money is going to be in the budget this year for more air aircraft carriers and high-level bombers, all focused on Tehran now, I wonder who's telling the United States to do that. Well, I, we know now. It's the same people who just declared war on Iran on behalf of the United States. Because when Israel declares war on Iran, which they did yesterday, and so this is the countdown to the end of the world. It just began yesterday, so Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I don't think the mathematical theory of everything really takes into account everything. Which is why I've given these 400 lectures was to bring out that point because I'm not a mathematician or physicist or discoverer. There's no word in my lexicon for what I am because whatever I think I am, it doesn't matter what I think I am. But if I had to just be objective about it, just based on my daily activity every single day of my life, it's been to try to understand everything. And in order to do that, it's necessary to make a very harsh split, which I've progressively, over the ta last two years of producing these lectures, I've learned more precisely what that split is that makes reality into two different arenas. It's almost like the quantum paradox that you're trying to compare two incommensurate things. Because if you go to try to define science, but then you try to put it in the library somewhere, like where does science go? What I discovered is a great simplifier which really solves a lot of 
I'll just say paradoxicality about the whole matter of reality. You have to distinguish between two different realities. And in the morphological approach, which is essentially a geometric approach, but more abstract, it's more having to do with relationships in general, it goes to a propositional logic, the basic language, the lingua franca of smart men, wise men, men who are trying to be rational, try to communicate so they can understand each other and make progress. It really comes down to you could be a morphologist, and I happen to be blessed with the master, Fritz Vicky. I was directed by Heavenly Design to come in contact with Fritz Vicky, the father of morphology. And the basic principle that I've learned in my own empirical course through this magnificent way of life and way of approaching reality, and Fritz did have several patents on the jet engine, and he's one of the co-inventors of the turbojet engine, so this guy is no slouch by any standard. Even American industrial standard, this guy's top-notch. And he invented morphology. Although it had been known, nobody systematized it. And he knew, as I know, that he was only making a beginning to a brand new scientific approach to reality which is structural, and that's all you need to know about morphology. But if you want to elaborate on it so you know exactly what it is, it's not mathematical. But everything in geometry, which this is, is related to mathematics, and that's known both on the linear side and on the progressive side. So when you're approaching reality, you need to distinguish on a binary split, if you can, what is reality. Because it's obviously more than one thing. It's at least nine billion things if you count the number of living humans. That'd be nine million, diff I'm sorry, billion. Nine billion different realities. Well, it's kind of like the proton. It's a distributed center. But they're all the same humans. But they're not all the same human. Let me say that again because this is superposition. One side of reality is human. Humanist, humanoid, human-like, human. Just whatever human is, that's one whole side. Some say it's the totality. They're obviously wrong. And here's why. By the way, the mathematicians are equally wrong. So the right binary split when facing reality is to distinguish between the emotional subsystem and the rational subsystem. And that defines the human mind completely on a binary split which can be substantiated, justified, supported, and made into a guiding principle. That's the nature of morphology, is to get orientation and direction so you go in the right direction toward your solution. You're much more likely to find your solution if you head toward it. So this is no laughing matter, the theory of everything. And it may seem like I just went off on a philosophical divagation, just to put it mildly or politely. Not at all. This is the bracketing information that constitutes the heart of science itself for communication from human to human. Because if you leave out the human side, you're entitled to do so, and sometimes you must if you're being technical. But if you're talking about the theory of everything, you're going to need to define what you mean by everything. And if you start with a superclass of scientific everything, you have two. Scientific everything and human everything. What if you could make that everything else? The logical way to do that is to realize that the human mind... M-I-N-D, look it up, and then erase all the definitions except for mine. When, when you have a definition in science, you want there to be one definition. Why? So we all can agree on it. Well, I have the one that everyone can agree on because the mind is defined exactly on the perfect binary split. 
between the emotional subsystem, which is blueprinted, part of it is love, so don't, okay, yeah. And the other one is rational logic, which is the basis of science. These are two distinct systems. They're not incompatible. They coexist in our mind. That is the mind. Now, since we're going towards the flight of the photon, which is my goal, is to understand the geometry of light propagation in free space, let's talk about consciousness. Because consciousness is based on light. Did you know that? You do now. I want you to think about that. That is merely a proposition. This is what you have to do at the cutting edge. You have to take a dare. You have to make a hypothesis. And for the duration of the, your hypothesis, you could be the biggest buffoon of all time. You have to take that chance. And the more chances you take, the more likely you are to get the right solution. But you don't want to be shooting fish in a barrel, as they say. You want to logically head towards the most likely solution. And if you get on the solution vector, try to realize that that's where you're at. And if you can always do that, you'll also be able to tell when you're not going toward the solution. So the theory of everything is actually the search for the equation of gravity and quantum electrodynamics. But quantum electrodynamics is a very highfalutin term, isn't it? How many syllables does that have? Electrodynamics. So that's six plus two. Eight syllables. I call it Q. One letter for an extremely good reason. Now what we're doing to bring into summary the bracketing information with now we're on track. What did I just do with the bracketing information? It's to dissociate ourselves from the emotional side. That's reality. That's the main reality. The scientific reality that you and I are dealing with is not reality in the same sense as human reality based on love and emotion and fun. Accept that because I spent a long time distilling that nugget of wisdom. Because that gives us a binary split that justifies the approach to the rational side. And what is the justification? Because I just made it sound trivial. They were just pursuing a parlor game. Well, I could say more on that because that's entirely possible in science. But what is rational logic actually for? If you haven't seen any of my last few dozen or hundred lectures, you might not know, so let me just state what that is but you're going to have to accept what I say because I'm not going to prove it right now. The human side is blueprinted, obviously. We know that from the behavior of babies and mothers. The babies respond to warmth and milk and taking care of their pain. Mothers respond with love. And there's no way around that's how you began, and that's how I began. We were sustained on love. We were not sustained on science. We were not sustained on logic. We were brought into this universe on the force of love. Now, one could then run with that, but that's exactly what we don't want to do in science. The only reason I went out to such a philosophical extreme as to correctly summarize the whole philosophical thing is so that we can make a binary split where we can put love and it's over here and science is over here and they don't overlap. In a way, they can't touch. But inside you, they not only touch, but you have to make them flow together. That's called wisdom, and that will be the result of all your scientific research, is when you're done with it, and you get the theory of everything, and you get the grand unification theory, 
and you win every Nobel Prize and you're beloved by humanity and your name and your face are immortal, if you get everything you want from science, you will have to open the door and walk back to your death. And then you might start thinking about love and what caused you to come into the universe. And if you have to wait until the last minute on your deathbed, that's your decision. But what happens with a full-grown man, not a high percentage, but I believe this happens to every man, and then there are other factors which may throttle it, but you realize that the reason you're a man is so that you can think. But then you have to answer the question, why am I blueprinted to think? That's called rational logic. It has nothing to do with emotion. It has nothing to do with love. You may make it serve your ends, as I did, by trying to make a living off of science. And a lot of us do in this world today. We're very grateful to the science community for giving us a means of support. Because while you're doing whatever you're doing, you still got to pay the rent, Charlie. So there's a lot of overlapping factors in what is science, what is the goal of science, why do we do science, and what might be the theory of everything. Because if you're talking about the theory of everything, I don't even care what you even might mean by that, although obviously you and I know, and I'm going to tell you the answer to it in this lecture. But you still have to walk back out the door, face your family, face your friends, face the sky, face the wind, Pay the bills, endure road rage, experience the tortures of wars all over the world, two of which are going out of control now, and then you're stuck. You're stuck back where you started from. And what good is your science? Well, it's easy to reduce that to technology, and if you want to waste your life thinking that, uh, me, perhaps you'll be rewarded for being an important wrench in the machine. Maybe your reward is to have been an important wrench in the machine because you made lasers or reactors or rockets. I would assume not for destruction, but of course you know there's a whole industry devoted to just that. So you're part of that. You're part of the war industry, but you're surviving. Do I have anything to say against that? I'm surviving, Charlie. I do the same things you do. There's no judgment, but in science, you need to close the door on that. Why? Is that a cop-out? That's a serious question. Is science a pastime? Is it a cop-out? Why aren't you dealing with some other level of reality besides your numbers, your theories, your concepts? What are you doing? Just making light bulbs? Just making railway lines? Just making a living? Is that all you're doing? Just making a living and using science as your excuse? Good. I did. <laughs> but is that science? Of course not. Not in the human sense. Because when you walk out that door of your laboratory or study, with your geometer's thing, or your slide rule, or your microscope, or your computer. Some kid, someday, is going to look up to you, if you're any kind of man at all. A child would be attracted to you, and will ask you, not might, will, ask you, what did you learn? What are you going to tell that kid? That science is whatever you can tell that kid. That's the goal of science. So I'm the first man in history to actually even attempt to define the goal of science. So you got a bonus today from your professor. And now I'm going to tell you the analytical solution to hyperspheric space. This will reformulate the Einstein field equation so we have the correct perception of gravity and we'll have the definition of the quantum 
and since I promised, that's I know that's what you want most, when these professors and scientists say that they're looking for quantum gravity, you and I need to step on their shoulders. And crush them into the mud. Because anybody who's looking for quantum gravity is stuck in the linear labyrinth. And that's the most polite, that's the most antiseptic, humanitarian way I can put it. Anybody who says the word, the term, it's a, a two-word term, quantum gravity, that person is deluded. And you're going to learn that right now. You may have already learned it from the last lecture. That's just the temptation to go back if you want. But I'm going to summarize everything now without even an outline proof. <laughs> so we use linear algebra for all of quantum physics, right? This is to get Q in the Q equals. What are we trying to equate the quantum with gravity? Well, gravity is centripetal force. Just accept that if you didn't see the last lecture, but it's obvious to any child, and I can prove it to a fifth grade audience. All you have to do is stand up from your chair. And that gives you the full geometry of gravity. You analyze the straight line that goes from the center of the Earth through your body to the edge of the universe and realize that the spherical surface of the earth is perpendicular to that line. And if you're clever, you're going to start to see the flight of the photon in its spherical aspect. But in order to see that totally, you would have to solve the quantum paradox. Let's do so. Let's actually do that. This is one of the two things that any scientist would have to do first in order to get quantum gravity yeah, there's, a, there's a preliminary step, there's a precursor that you have to get first. So to get the theory of everything, which is the equation of gravity with the quantum, you're going to have to define gravity. We did that in the last lecture and just did it again now, so that's half the problem. We know what gravity is. It's centripetal force in spherical space, correct? Obviously it is. Centripetal force in spherical space centripetal force in spherical space based on the integral effect of protonic centripetal force that's been proved so now we have the center of the universe but it's skewed because it's not the center of the universe it's all the protons are the centers and you have to say plural why because they're particles what's a particle it's a proton. That's the only particle in the whole universe. There's just one particle. You will accept that because I'm correct. So we have one particle. That's the infinitesimal in physical space. That's the physical infinitesimal is the proton. We know its radius and we also know the geometry of its surface. And from that we get the geometry of the universe that's closed, coherent, only uses positive whole numbers, and is a two-component number that takes the place of complex numbers. Not only does it give us the solution to the calculus nightmare, it dispenses with sine-cosine irrationality, and it also dispenses with a complex number system. This will rewrite Dirac's equation. I'll go to Dirac first, because he got the relativistic solution for the quantum wave equation. The quantum is a wave. The quantum is a wave. That's a direct contradiction on the primary meaning of quantum. And so the word quantum is the error. The error in quantum gravity is the quantum. There is no such thing the way it's been formulated. And that's called the quantum paradox. The quantum paradox is you can't say what it is and you cannot compute an equation for it. 
Dirac did so anyway, but he only did so in the only way that a man can. One part of the paradox. He got the wave equation. So did Schrodinger. And it's interesting that Schrodinger's equation has two versions. We'll get to that much later. I've penetrated this all the way to the end. So I'm retracing my steps to give this to you. I already know that this works. But you must never trust the human unless you believe he has the proofs. But even then, you're going to want to see the proofs. But that's impossible right now. And that's the nature of divulging a secret. I could give a six-hour lecture and give you all the proofs. Or I can give you this one-hour lecture without the proofs. But I'm telling you, the proofs exist. So we're going to go on as if you were going to believe everything I say, but I'm required to tell you. This is the hypothesis step from your point of view. Okay? Until you know the proofs, that's what it has to be. But I am not lying to you. All right. So, we have the center of the universe now with two problems. One is, it's not the center of the spatial universe. But it is a local center of physical space, which is saying a lot because that describes the behavior of any gravitational body or any gravitational system that we know of. To the degree that we know Newtonian mechanics for gravity, which has been amply shown to be pretty accurate, Einstein magnificently improved on the Newtonian formulation of G, gravity. One of the two components of quantum gravity is gravity, and we now know that the best formulation in linear space, the 4D solution that Einstein amazingly achieved. The amazing achievement of Albert Einstein was to use 3D cubic space with an imaginary orthogonal vector that he called negative time, and that solves for gravity to a threshold of precision so exceeding that of Newton that it is now known that spaceflight would be impossible with Newtonian gravity. In order to navigate, sometimes called astrogate, the solar system, as indeed we had to do with the James Webb telescope and anything we've launched even to the moon, if you don't know relativity and you don't use Einstein's equation for space-time, you won't make it. And you're going to have a devil of a time getting there anyway, and we could not have gotten there without computers. So this was a time-dependent penetration of local astral space, came from a linear solution, which is adequate, obviously, for the solar system. The linear solution works. However, the linear solution, even for gravity that Einstein got, has a gaping wound in it that renders it unusable for cosmic space. In other words, the Einstein field equation for gravity, the G in, in quantum gravity would be this, it's space-time, but that's a hypercubic system with a zero at the center. And as I have just told you in the last lecture, and you can figure out now immediately, I hope, there's no zero. So there's no center to the system. In fact, the center that's used, called zero, is a pseudo-infinity that breaks the multiplication division system of mathematics at its fundamental level because you cannot divide by zero. The universe forbids it. I'm not the one that you need to go to to get the final authoritative ruling on that. The I, E, E, E. <laughs> I raised my eyebrows for every E. Says that you cannot divide by zero, and the universe says so. So that is science, and so linear algebra is dead. However, it can't be dead because those are the computable numbers, and so we have to have them. But how do you use them correctly to get rid of zero? You transfer from the linear space to spherical space. 
And when you do so, you would find out, as I did in, in 19... <laughs> and that's not 19, is it? It's 2000, yeah. Uh, in 2022... <laughs> never mind. Into, not 1922, 2022. You would have to find the number system for spherical space, obviously. Otherwise, you're just back to using linear numbers. Well, you have to use linear numbers. But what if you could get a better solution than Einstein to gravitational space? That would be the theory of everything. That would be quantum gravity. That's why they say quantum gravity. They want something better than what Einstein got. They want gravity to be true at the subatomic level. I can now show you that that dream can come true. Gravity is at the center of the universe. But that's a mind splitter. The center of the universe. Every geometer knows that if you say center, that is an impenetrable point. But if it's zero, it's a derivative infinity. And that's why it fails. Because the real center point is one over infinity. It's not zero, which is an infinity. It's the result of adding plus and minus infinity is you get the infinitesimal infinity. That's zero. That works on the line for add. We don't use add. We use multiply in physics. Why? I proved that in 2022. Because the linear numbers exist in order to compose the spherical numbers. And it has to go in that order. And that's why nobody was able to discover this until I discovered it. It's because it's that difficult to see. But now I hope you see it. Here's how you see it. The center is 1 over infinity. And the edge is infinity over 1. Those are both imaginary because infinity is imaginary. But if it's infinity over 1, it has to have a reciprocal at the center. If you accept that axiomatically, which you'd better, you can now compose a two-component number with this as the base number. What is this? It's a two-component number, but it doesn't have real imaginary. It has super real, super real. These are whole positive fractions. But the, there's two special ones, the two infinities. The poles of spherical space are the center and the edge. But if you give an integral imaginary number to the edge, you need an infinitesimal number for the center. That's 1 over spherical infinity. Put that here. Put infinity over 1 in the other one. This one's reciprocal to the other. It is 1, 1 on this diagonal. And infinity, infinity on this diagonal. You multiply them together. You multiply imaginary infinity out of the number system entirely because it's imaginary at the two edges and cannot be reached. But what you're left with is a one at the harmonic center. And that makes two centers. The center, which is the point, and the numeric center, which is a sphere around that point, which now you can see the sphere has an interior, and the sphere has an exterior. The interior of the sphere is imaginary, so there's nothing less than one. But when you go to compose the number system, you can imagine the first quantum jump, since these are whole positive numbers only, Max Planck has this, you're going to accept that now because you know I'm telling the truth. The quantum jump is from one to two. That's the index of spherical space. It's also the index of quantum space once we complete the reciprocal jump because there's two jumps. It's not just one jump. Max Planck discovered the quantum jump for the energy transfer, but he forgot to compute in the space differential. This is the inverse of the problem that Einstein solved. The time differential for volume space this is the space differential for the manifestation of time. So to make that simple, 
we have space shells going out. Obviously, that fills the universe with numbers in space. But as the 2345 or 24816, we'll get to that, as these shells go out, these are quantum shells, this is well known from physics, this is the definition of the atom, is that these shells go out. That's space. That's obvious. The question is, what's inside? Because we can see that it's a sphere, so it definitely has an interior. What's in there? You have to say it in two ways in order to see it, and you'll have to split your mind somehow and then bring it back. So this is the perceptual crux, the paradox, if you would. However, I'm going to show you, as you follow along, this makes perfect mathematical sense. You have the two, three, four going out in shells. If you go linearly toward the center on the Zeno's paradox, it goes halfway to the center. And if these are harmonic numbers, just think half, quarter, eight. That's an infinite sequence. There's a second infinite sequence going out. These numbers stop just before infinity. So it's a finite number system, but it depends on the metric. What is the highest number and what is the lowest number? And so we don't apply a metric to it yet. We simply are giving the geometry for the static sphere. So this sphere is a one. And every quantum number is one beginning with 2 over 1, 1 over 2. 2 over 1 times 1 over 2 is 1. That's a shell going out. If you think of it as a shell going in, it's going into imaginary space. However, Albert Einstein gave us the key. It's not going in. He proved that time is orthogonal to space. So if indeed the surface of the sphere is time, then the half goes along the sphere. But it's a temporal number, so it actually divides a periodic manifestation called angular momentum, also called energy. Angular momentum and energy are based on a flash, a repetitive event on a closed line called a circle. When the sphere starts to rotate, it manifests a circle. It's distributed throughout the sphere, but we can measure it on the equator. It goes one, two, three, four, in time. So this is a time measurement. It has two components, the wavelength and frequency. The wavelength is how many pieces, or I should say, the length of the pieces that the circle is divided into. For instance, two. That would be a wavelength of two. The circle is no longer one, it's one half on this side. I should say, yeah, one half on this side and one half. So the period is two, is, you could say the period is two and the wavelength is one half. You can actually reverse that. It's not greatly important at this moment, but you could reverse that. That will become important in hyperspheric space. This is called the simple harmonic and it's a manifestation of motion. Angular momentum and energy are pure motion. They're, they're not spatial. They're temporal. And temporal is not measured in linear spatial separation as we're accustomed to doing with linear numbers. It has to be a circular number. But it can be composed in linear proportional numbers as 1 over 2. But it... But the... But the <laughs> That's an inner function on the circle. All we need to worry about is the one half, but you can see that the one half is related to a two, even on the sphere. But the important part is, when you compose a spherical number, the two is a space shell going out, and the one half is the period of angular momentum, or the wavelength. It's either the frequency or the wavelength. So we're looking at the we're looking at the difference between spatial spherical separation, which is in quantum shells, to any degree of precision, by the way, depending on your metric, it depends on your smallest spherical separation, but that is the quantum jump. So even though the sphere is continuous, 
as it manifests space, there are quantum spherical jumps. That's called the quantum jump from one to two. Max Planck discovered that. In the energy transfer, he found that energy is transferred in packets. And that entails a physical jump which violates a basic law of the universe. And so Max Planck absolutely is wrong. He discovered linear quantum. It's a linear concept. The Boschkevich force curve shows that that's not a linear change. It's not a jump. In the jump that Max Planck saw, which annoyed him and confounded everybody, but now we accept that it, it's called the quantum. That quantum, which is considered to be a probabilistic state, it's actually imaginary space. Nobody can figure out what the quantum even is because it cannot be stated what it is because it's continuous. Now we can state what it is. It's not imaginary, but it's a different data type. It's a periodic measurement on the equator of the sphere, but does the proton or electron have an equator? The proton does not. Although you could say so, it, 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 it's magnetized. So it could be said to have a pole. But it doesn't seem to rotate. Now it does have something called spin, but that's not actually angular momentum. And nobody denies that. that that's not speaking out of school. Spin is a very strange term. I understand why the word spin is used. But every subatomic particle physicist who talks about electron spin is not talking about something spinning. You can look that up in Wikipedia, for instance. So this, this relationship that we've established is an orthogonal relationship between centripetal force, which instead of the, these shells going out, you could think of them as going in. And that's called the curvature of space. It is perfectly conceived as a series of concentric shells which could have a direction. Well, in centripetal force, it does have a direction. It's being stretched. Now, in centrifugal force manifested in the electron, the thing is trying to fly apart. The proton is trying to collapse. So this is the infinitesimal center of spatial space. Whereas the electron is apparently the manifestation of centrifugal force and waveform, but it's a bound waveform, and that's that's a paradox. Is how is the electron bound? In order to get the answer to that, we need to transfer to hyperspheric space because the electron is not really of this universe. Only the proton informs us of spatial universe. Light informs us of non-spatial universe, motion universe. Light is nothing if not motion. You could say it's pure motion, but what gives it its speed? Why does it go approximately 300,000 kilometers per second? Why does it go at that speed and no other? That's a very difficult question to answer until you understand spherical geometry. So in the next lecture, we're going to cover that. And from that, we're going to get the quantum but let me show you, since I promised to show you in this lecture, where is the quantum? First of all, picture the proton, which has a radius that has been measured of 0 0.8 femtometers. When an electron comes in toward the proton, it's coming in from linear infinity. Picture this. And it accelerates. And then it hits the proton and they both annihilate each other, correct? No. No, not quite. It looks like it's, it's doing so. The electron accelerates toward the proton. But now we need to magnify the image. 
and call a line, the target of the electron is going to be this line. And that will be the proton. The center of the proton is right here. Picture it is all the way over here so I don't have to use my hand. And now the electron is here. And it's just sitting there. And now we turn on the camera. The electron has no velocity of its own. What happens is, immediately, it starts to go toward the proton. And as it does, it obeys the inverse square law. And because it's inverse square, it means it's going in, that's inverse, and square means it's accelerating, correct? So it's accelerating and it goes faster and faster and faster as it approaches the proton. Now, look over here again to the edge of the screen. That is the proton stretched out vertically so that we can use the vertical axis to represent a force. So the vertical axis is a force and right here is zero. In other words, not repulsive and not attractive. So the horizontal line is zero force. Okay? The physical trajectory of the electron does not change. It goes on a straight, it, it goes on that line, but it accelerates. The way to show the acceleration is by going up on a curve. So when the electron is way over here, there's a certain amount of force pulling it. The force increases. And as the force increases, the electron curves. The curving shows acceleration. And when it reaches that line, it goes asymptotic at one femtometer and completes its asymptotic change to a certain visualizable part of the curve, it changes to asymptotic and does not come back. It keeps going. Does it go to infinity? No, there is, there is no way to reach infinity in spherical space, remember? So how far does it get? That's the time domain. It goes into the time domain. So the electron, when it's over here, has a spatial characteristic. And it comes in on linear infinity and accelerates. And as it gets to the one femtometer right about here, it begins to go asymptotic perpendicularly. And it goes asymptotic to the force line. That is the force line of repulsive force. The reason the electron cannot hit the proton is the proton is impenetrable. It's impenetrable to its antiparticle. These are the only two particles that are in dual in the whole universe. And there's only one spatial particle, the proton. That means that the electron is a manifestation of centripetal force coming in on a centripetal line. And it shifts from the space domain to the time domain. And when it's done, it's at a right angle to gravity. And that is the quantum. This is Anagalactic. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Thank you.